Those of you who follow this channel know that I'm pretty hyped about Unity's new implementation of the Entity Component System pattern, also known as Unity ECS. But the more I play around with it, the more I can see that it's got a long way to go before it's ready for production. I mean, don't get me wrong, what I've seen and been able to accomplish so far using the beta has been nothing short of incredible. But Unity ECS in its current form is still missing a lot of important features. If you caught my recent video on Unity ECS, then you know that the development team's long-term goal is to iteratively refactor Unity until each of its underlying features utilizes the new ECS implementation. It won't just be used for game code, but also for the many features that make up the Unity game engine, from physics simulation to graphics rendering. This will allow Unity developers to customize Unity to meet each of their own specific needs. But until that day arrives, the developers over at Unity have given us the ability to use a sort of hybrid version of the implementation. To understand why this is so important, we'll need to define both the pure and hybrid forms of Unity ECS. The pure ECS implementation doesn't use game objects. Instead, it uses entities that, as of the latest beta, must be created in your code using something called an entity manager. Mono behaviors are also a thing of the past with pure ECS. Instead, data is stored inside of structs that derive from iComponent data, and logic is held in system classes that derive from component system or job component system. Pure ECS systems are meant to utilize Unity's new c -sharp job system as much as possible which of course means tons of performance benefits thanks to the burst compiler and multi-threading. Hybrid ECS, on the other hand, includes all of the features of pure ECS with the addition of helper classes that convert game objects into entities and mono behaviors into components. The game object entity mono behavior converts any game object that it's attached to into an entity and converts each of that game object's mono behaviors into an ECS component. And because hybrid ECS code tends to utilize existing game objects and mono behaviors, systems typically need to derive from the component system class, which supports managed objects. This, in my opinion, is the key ingredient that makes hybrid ECS work so well with Unity as we know it today. The Unity ECS implementation is still missing many built-in components that can be used by job-based systems and having access to mono behaviors based on features like rigid bodies and animation controllers really makes hybrid ECS invaluable. All right, enough talk. Let's see what these two implementations look like in action. The example project for this video, which will be available to my $5 plus tier patrons on Patreon, demonstrates basic player movement implemented in both pure and hybrid ECS. What you're looking at here is the end result Let's start with a fresh scene and implement this functionality using hybrid ECS. To start off, our scene will contain nothing more than the third person character model found in Unity's standard assets, stripped of its custom scripts of course, and a platform for him to stand on. We'll call this scene hybrid ECS. Now, in order to get our player moving, we're gonna need to associate some data with it using components. These components will be used by our systems to add behavior. But before we can do all that, we'll need to create an entity that will represent our player. In hybrid ECS, this is accomplished using the game object entity component. Adding this component to the player game object causes two things to happen. First, an entity is created behind the scenes, which we can see here in the entity debugger as entity zero. This is the entity that will represent the player. Second, each component that's attached to the player game object is added to the new entity. For the player, this includes the transform, animator, rigid body, and capsule collider. Again, all of this is done automatically by the game object entity mono behavior, which will continue to keep the unity updated as components are added to and removed from the player game object. All right. Let's add a couple of components that'll help us get our player moving. We'll call this first one speed, which will represent the player's movement speed. And we'll name the second one player input, 
which for now will just represent horizontal axis input. Both of these components will be extremely simple, containing one piece of data each. Speed will have a float called value. and player input will have a float called horizontal. And believe it or not, that's all the data we'll need to get our player moving. Let's create a system to interpret that data and translate it into behavior. We'll start with the system that'll actually perform the transformation to the player's position, i.e. the player movement system. In hybrid ECS, systems are derived from component system and must implement the onUpdate method. onUpdate is where all the action happens. And by action, I of course mean our game's logic. Before we write it, we'll need a way to tell our system which entities to include in that logic. Let's define a struct called group that contains a property for each component that we want the system's entities to contain. Then, Pass it in on component systems get entities method. Get entities returns a list of entities that contain all of the components that are properties of the struct that's passed in on its generic type parameter. In other words, we're implicitly telling the player movement system to only perform our logic on entities that have a transform, speed, and player input component attached to it. Now, it's just a matter of writing some basic movement logic. All right, we need one more system to complete the functionality. Our player movement system uses the player input component horizontal axis data to apply the transformation, but this value is never actually updated, at least not yet. Let's create a system called player input system that'll use Unity's native input class to update the player input components in our scene. Just like before, we'll have the player input system derive from component system and implement on update. Now we'll define a struct that contains a player input property, since this system will only be interested in entities that have the player input component. Now we can use get entities to return and iterate over all the entities that meet our requirements. And for each one, Use unity.getAccess to update the value of the horizontal float property. And that's it. Now, just a quick side note. Our scene, or world, as it's referred to in Unity ECS, only contains a single entity, so I can understand if it may seem like overkill to include a loop in each of our systems. But in general, your systems will be looping over many entities, so I've included the logic the way it is in order to show off what your code will look like in most cases. Okay, let's switch on over to the editor and see this in action. Before we press play, we'll need to set the speed property. All right, let's see what we got. Great. There are two things I should point out though. First, the obvious. I've created a custom animation system, which is why you're seeing the player model animate when it moves left and right. That code, of course, will be accessible to patrons who download the final project. And second, there's a little bit of magic going on behind the scenes in regards to our systems. You may have already noticed that we didn't need to explicitly activate our systems or add them to the scene in any way. But under the covers, Unity is aware of all classes that derive from component system and automatically loads them when the scene starts. We can actually see this in the Entity Debugger. Check it out. Here are the two systems we just created. The Entity Debugger is a great tool for, well, debugging systems, because not only can we use it to see what systems are loaded, but we can also use it to activate and deactivate systems at runtime. If we deactivate the player input system, then player input components will no longer be updated, and the player won't respond to our input. This is really handy in many situations, but particularly for cases where you need to isolate a system in order to debug some sort of errant behavior. So that was hybrid ECS.
Now, let's re-implement the same movement logic using pure ECS. We'll start again with our original scene, but this time without the player game object. Remember, pure ECS doesn't support game objects, so we'll need to create the player entity and all of its components in the code. Before we get started, let's save this scene and call it pure ECS. Just like before, we're going to need a player entity with some data for our systems to act on. Let's start with the components that we already know we're going to need. Speed and player input. Pure ECS components must be structs that derive from iComponent data. This will allow us to include them in the job-based systems that make Pure ECS so performant. All right. Now we need an entity that represents the player to add these components to. With hybrid ECS, this was as easy as creating a game object with some mono behaviors and a game object entity component attached to it. But pure ECS isn't intended to work with game objects, so we'll need to do this part by hand using the only mono behavior that our scene will really need. We'll call it bootstrap, and its job will be to, well, bootstrap our entities and their components. Pure ECS entities are created using an Entity Manager, and Entity Managers are created using the Static World class. We want the Bootstrap logic to kick off as soon as the scene starts, so we'll place it in Bootstrap Start method. Now, we can use the Entity Manager to create an entity for our player, which we'll do by calling Entity Entity. For this particular example, we're going to pass in all of the components that the player entity needs in order to achieve our movement functionality. Those of you who've read up on Pure ECS will know all about archetypes, but I'm going to skip them to keep this example as simple as possible. Just know that archetypes are used to optimize the memory layout of your entity components, and really comes in handy when you have more than one entity in your scene. You can expect to see a video covering archetypes soon. All right, so let's examine the components that we've given to the player entity. At the top, we can see the two custom components that we just created, speed and player input. Underneath those are three components that are now built into Unity, which are used by a few systems that are also built into Unity. The position component is used by the built-in transform system, which works in tandem with the mesh instance renderer system. The Mesh Instance Renderer system uses the Transform Matrix and Mesh Instance Renderer components in order to display meshes in the scene. A couple of these components, namely Speed and Mesh Instance Renderer, need to be initialized in order to work the way we want them to. So let's expose some values to the editor. Great. Now we can use them to set the values of their respective components. Mesh Instance Renderer is a special type of component called a shared component. So we can set that one with a different method. Great. Now we can switch back to the editor. Set the values of speed, mesh, and material. And see what our player entity looks like using the entity debugger. Well, we can see the player model in the scene, so we know that the mesh instance renderer is working. And we can see that the player entity speed component value is set correctly. So let's create some systems. We'll start again with the player movement system. In pure ECS, systems typically derive from job component system and implement an on update method with a slightly different signature. Instead of holding logic, on update is now responsible for running a C sharp job that contains the logic. Let's create a job called player movement job so we can see what this actually looks like. Just like iComponent data, player movement job must be a struct. 
and it'll derive from iJob process component data. iJob process component data can take up to three generic type parameters. Similar to hybrid ECS, this is how pure ECS systems know which entities to perform their logic on. We'll pass in speed, player input, and position for this particular job, and implement the required method. Behind the scenes, Unity will pass the correct components into this job's execute method for each entity the system iterates over. Now let's add some player move logic. One thing I should note is that we won't be able to access Unity's native time class since jobs don't run on the main thread. So we'll need to pass in delta time. Easy enough. With that complete, we can now schedule this job inside of player movement systems execute method. And that's all there is to it. This pure ECS system gains all the benefits of Unity's new c -sharp job system, including an optimized data layout, multi-threading, and all of the optimizations made by the new Burst compiler. We're on the home stretch now, we just need to create a system to handle player input. Just like before, the player input system needs to derive from job component system and implement the onUpdate method. Now, we need to create a struct that derives from iJob process component data and pass player input in on the generic type parameter. We'll implement execute and add some basic logic that updates player input's horizontal float value. And again, since c -sharp jobs don't run on the main thread, we'll need to pass in the value for the horizontal access from Unity's native input library. Lastly, we can create and schedule this job inside of player input systems on update method. And that is all there is to it. Let's run this in the editor. All right, working great, except for two glaring issues. One, the player model isn't animated. And two, the player is floating above the platform. That's because Pure ECS is still missing some important systems that will presumably be built in sometime in the future. For us, those systems would be an animation or mechanism system, and, of course, a physics system. There's nothing stopping us from writing our own systems right now, however, but we just need to weigh our options and see if it's the right course of action for our team. That being said, Unity ECS is still in beta and not production ready. Which is fine, because the developers on the Unity ECS and Job Systems teams are working hard to get these exciting new features just right. And we can expect to see plenty of new, built-in components and systems in the following months. Don't forget to head on over to my Patreon page where, for just $5, you can get access to the project that was shown off in this video. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and a comment letting me know what you thought. And for more Unity tutorials just like this one, don't forget to subscribe with notifications on. I'll catch you in the next video. Thank you to all my patrons, and a special shout out to Glasswell Entertainment, Richard Stance, R-Star, and Yakov.